I call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for December 5, 2017. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Olivia Ginsky, a Carver uh, 12th grader. Um, we will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Ms. Ginsky. I mean, I, I can just start it. Like this. Hold it. That's okay. You want to record it. Okay. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first item on our agenda is to consider our, our agenda. Uh, Ms. White, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? All right, the, the agenda as presented is the agenda for the evening. Uh, Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to this meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this uh, evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Uh, the completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 to be drawn by Josie Schaefer and read by Steve Virch will be the speakers for tonight. Margaret Gibson. Kimberly Fields. Sharon Sorrell. Ame Nadim. Ross Keene. Lori Phelps. Isaac Khan. Faith Bryce. Nina Jenkins. <laughs> Dr. Boschperon. Thank you. Those uh, will be our 10 speakers this evening. Uh, next on our agenda, item E, is a special order of business, the election of board officers for uh, this coming um, board year, December 2017 uh, to December 2018. Um, we have two uh, board um, officers, the board chair and the board vice chair. Is there a motion for board chair? Mr. Stewart. Yes. I'd like to move that Mr. Gillis is our board chair for the coming year. Is there a second? No need for a second. Yes, I will conduct it. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> okay, so in accordance with board policy 8210, the first meeting in December is designated for the election of board officers. As chair nominations are now open for the office of board chair. Again, are there any nominations um, for board chair? I nominate Kathleen Causey. Mrs. Causey is nominated. Are there other nominations for board chair? Yes, I nominate Mr. Gills. Chair recognizes Mr. Stewart, Stewart and says that um, Mr. Gillis is being nominated for board chair. Are there any further nominations for the office of board chair? Hearing no further nominations, the chair declares the nominations closed. All those who vote for Mrs. Causey as chair, please raise your hands. We have discussion. Now there is no discussion. Why is there no discussion? Is that not look to per um, Roberts rules? Uh, are legal? It's uh, elections are elections. Okay. 
Okay, so hearing that, all those who vote for Mrs. Causey as chair, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four. Ms. Causey has four votes. All those who uh, vote for Mr. Gillis as chair, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I am pleased to announce that Mr. Gillis has been elected as chair of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I turn it back over to you. All right. The, uh, the second office to be filled is the office of vice chair. Are there nominations for vice chair? Mrs. Causey. Thank you. I would like to nominate Mrs. Julie Hen. All right. Are there any other nominations? Mr. McDaniels. I would like to nominate Nicholas Stewart. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, I declare the nominations closed. Uh, it's time to vote all in favor of the first nominee, Ms. Hen. Please raise your hands. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five. All in favor of Mr. Stewart, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, seven votes. Mr. Stewart is elected as vice chair. Congratulations, Mr. Stewart. <laughs> now, if we can have a little um, musical chairs here for a second, I'll ask Mr. Virch to move over where Mr. Stewart is. I'll ask Ms. Schaefer to move where Mr. Virch was. <laughs> Um, and ask Mr. Stewart to come to my right. Not Steve. The names are different. Josie, I hardly knew you. Steve. I don't know what else. Okay, welcome. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your comments to the superintendent for follow-up by her staff. Uh, while we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing resolution processes as appropriate. Uh, I ask that you observe the three-minute clock, uh, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your, mar or your remarks when you hear the bell. Um, uh, the microphone um, uh, will likely be turned off at the end of that three-minute time. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Very good. Uh, Mr. Yulfelder suggested that I just advise that we have new microphones here tonight, and uh, the microphones are longer, come closer to our mouths, so hopefully we'll be heard better. Um, and they also have to be turned on when the board member uh, wishes to speak. That does two things. One, um, it has less microphones on when others are speaking, particularly at the desk here. Um, and um, uh, so we hope you bear with us uh, because we might be reminding each other to turn the microphones on. Um, I have been told by the staff that there are two special guests in the room this evening, uh, Delegate Charles Sidnor and National Teacher of the Year Sean McComb. Uh, if you'll both stand and if either of you wants to come and speak for a, a couple of minutes, please do. You're on. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to, to speak this evening, and uh, thank you for the work that you do on behalf of our uh, students and community every um, day. My name is Sean McComb. I teach students English at Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts in Dundalk, and I am the 2014 Baltimore County, Maryland, National Teacher of the Year. 
I'm here tonight to talk about change. In the last few years, this school system has sustained a great deal of change. Um, as I traveled the country and have worked at the Department of Education for the United States, I've seen that change is a common thread across the country. <laughs> However, in Baltimore County, I think it's important to recount that some of the changes that we have um, been engaged in. For our students, we've engaged in work, deep work around equity and restorative practices, and I think these are very important. In terms of pedagogy, we've looked into personalization, form of assessment, flexible grouping. Our grading policy as a high school English teacher, I can tell you now, includes a lot of redos. That's a lot of essay feedback for me to give. Again, good, important changes. Technology, we have a new phone system, we have new projection system, we have new devices, we have technology tools to make the most of that. And in many communities, we have big demographic changes happening. But most importantly, one thing I haven't mentioned is that we have drastically raised the standards for success, our core expectations for students in our school system. But something hasn't changed. What hasn't changed are the conditions in which teachers try to carry out this work. In a 2013 study of 34 nations, America's teachers spent the most hours per week on classroom instruction which might seem wonderful on its face, but what that means is that our classroom teachers do have less time to evaluate student work, to adjust their planning for students' needs, to learn how to evolve as a teacher to better meet these needs. All of this is assumed to happen in 45 minutes a day. We're also trying to grade and plan and copy and call home and fill out reports and maybe even visit the bathroom. In many instances, being a great teacher means living in a reality where you come face to face with children with incredible needs, work yourself to exhaustion, to try to meet that need and know you may not come that close because of the conditions we work in. Ask around, teachers are exhausted. Living in this tension is difficult and some of us are barely hanging in. Why do I tell you this tonight? Because I believe there's a small group of people who are out of touch with this reality who wanna see more change, who believe that bringing in an outsider with their own contrived vision for our school system without knowing our community would be a good thing that somehow further destabilizing, disrupting the school system would somehow be good for kids. I'm here to tell you that further piling initiatives onto our teachers and passing that stress and challenge onto students is not good. It would more likely lead to a lot of people throwing their hands in the air because we can only sustain so much change at a time. It could mean mass exodus or worse, it could mean people who stay but disengage from the work. We are considering choosing churn changing leadership four times in seven years, and that has never been Baltimore County. If we do, why would anyone deeply commit to seeing something? And there's further risk. In a study published this summer, studying leadership churn in school districts, researchers found that turnover in district leadership undermined connections at work, weakened emotional ties, and led to churn for principals. In short, leadership churn undermines the positive, trusting relationships across a school system that allow us to learn from one another. And why would we want to change? Yes, Verlita, Verlita White made a mistake. Mistakes happen. Anyone you hire to be a superintendent will make a mistake. What I think is remarkable is how Ms. White handled her mistake. By being transparent, by being forthright, by working with you all to safeguard against a similar mistake happening again. That is leadership. Verlita has, to the surprise of no one who knows her, set forth initiatives for literacy and school environments that are dovetailed to where our system has been, responsive to the needs of the community, and insightful for where our students need to go. I believe in her leadership. I believe in a leader who got a standing ovation from principals in her first appearance after being announced as interim superintendent. Have you met principals? They don't give standing ovations. <laughs> I believe in a person who is beset by hugs wherever she goes in the school system. I believe in a leader who has been in the system nearly her entire life, not only as a student, but then learning the system and growing her capacity in the classroom, as a school administrator, and throughout central office. What an opportunity for us to have as our leader. Our boat as a system has been rocked. The water is churning. We need a calm and insightful leader at the helm, and we have one. We are at an important moment for this school system, for 113,000 students who look to us to support their dreams. And we have an opportunity to have the type of leader that other districts would dream of having. We are making progress. We need to sustain that progress. I implore you to act for in sustained improvement, to act in the best interest of our students and our future, and to hire Verlita White as our superintendent. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. McComb.
uh, and thank you for being such a great ambassador for Baltimore County. Uh, Delegate Sinor, uh, we recognize you and thank you for being here if you want to come forward, but you don't have to, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, now it's time for our advisory and stakeholder groups. The first uh, is the Baltimore County Student Council, and that's Jake Turner. Mr. Turner. No, that's not Josie sitting next to me. <laughs> um, good evening, board. Um, today I just want to let you all know what we're doing in Baltimore County Student Councils. Um, so first, my name is Jake Turner. Um, I'm the Baltimore County Student Council President currently. Um, so on December 14th, BCSC will have its first General Assembly. Um, I'm really proud to announce that this will be the largest Baltimore County Student Council event ever in our history of existing, which is really cool. We have about 300 student delegates from every corner of the county coming um, to attend the day. Um, I'm also excited to share that the BCPS community superintendents will be attending that day. Um, there will be a time where all the students will be able to ask the community superintendents questions that they do have and share input um, on how their school life is going and um, about what changes they feel should be made in the school. Um, and last, I just want to inform you guys that we will be um, hosting the Maryland Association of Student Councils Convention, um, which is a huge honor. So we're going to host about 1,000 students from all across Maryland, um, and we're all really excited to do that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Jake. Our next speaker is a representative from TABCO, and that's Glenn Galante. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, and members of the board. I'm bringing remarks tonight for Abby Baton. Uh, she is attending a conference in St. Paul, Minnesota, and she could not be here tonight. The issue we are addressing this evening is the ever-growing substitute issue in our schools. The issue has become extremely important because it's affecting our students. Teachers need to have time away from their students and for a variety of reasons. The most common, of course, is when a teacher is ill and needs time to recover from that illness. When substitutes were plentiful and willing to work for a little money on the side, for the most part, substitutes did a great job filling in for teachers following the lesson plans left by the teachers, working with the students to move them forward. Now the pool of substitutes has dwindled, leaving plans <coughs> that the substitute can follow uh, has become very difficult and problematic. Part of the pressure comes when we need to find time for teachers to collaborate with other teachers during the school day. This is very important work, but finding substitutes to help to provide that time is difficult. Part of the pressure is that teaching has gotten so difficult and people are under so much stress. They need to take the time just to relieve the stress. I just had a phone call today from someone <laughs> who was out for that very reason. Just tremendous uh, amount of stress and pressure. The solution to the problem is never easy, but starting with paying substitutes that we could go a long way. For someone with a college degree, we pay them $91 a day. That's not a lot of money. The job is difficult and the pay is not very much considering the importance of the work. We must push for funding to be able to encourage more people willing to serve as substitutes. Some systems have encouraged their retired teachers or retired administrators to serve as substitutes by making a separate category for those folks. We need to become much more proactive and thoughtful as we address these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is the representative from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, and that's Helen Weld Doyle. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. I am sending out a, um, a formula, a chart that the Special Education Citizen Advisory Council put together to kind of give you an idea of where we are looking at this year. Um, my name is Helen Doyle. I am the Secretary for CCAC, and thank you for letting me speak this evening. Last evening, we welcomed Relita White and many of, the, um, many of the staff from the Special Education Department, and we were just so happy with the way that if we feel like we're getting somewhere. We have had several changes in administration over the last several years, and we're really happy. We feel like we're finally, you know, pushing it together and getting things where we need to be. Um, thank you, for Lita, for addressing our concerns. 
we really felt like she was a breath of fresh air, and we really haven't been this far, this, this far in the year. Um, we feel she definitely understands the needs of our system and is a champion for our kids, and that's really important to us. Um, on the handouts, I'm gonna ask you to take a look at it. And what I'm looking for is staffing. That is what I'm coming here for tonight. Um, where I, when I grew up, um, it was impolite to ask, but um, I realized if we don't ask, we're not gonna get what we need. So my ask is staffing. And I wanted to kind of take a look at um, some of the comments that were made earlier as far as raising our standards for success and making sure we have the best person in that classroom every day. And we really need bodies in the classroom. We need someone who's gonna be there to work with our children. Um, so we have early intervention and prevention plans for our infants and toddlers. And hopefully with a, a concerted effort from a very young age, we will not need the level of services as our children get older. Our, ma our major request is for teachers. We would like to see a minimum of three teachers in every school. Our, our best scenario would obviously be to have the staffing match the actual hours on the IEP plan, but we'll take what we can get. And we know that um, this is a really important ask for us. Our regional programs are in, in, increasing every year. They're expanding and we really wanna see more manageable caseloads for those teachers. And we would like to see a better service delivery model. Um, these are our babies. We are sending you the best we have and we really need you to make a good choice. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is from the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County, Lila Marinbloom. Good evening, board members, Chairman Gillis, and Interim Superintendent, Ms. White. I'm Lila Manbloom. I'm here to talk to you about Kronos, the timekeeping system which is so negatively impacting the daily work routine of my 1,000 plus <laughs> members. I have spoken to the board, to Mr. Burke, Ms. White, and her predecessor, Dr. Dance, about this issue. I know that my members' issues with Kronos are not being ignored. These issues are apparently being turned over to an anonymous, exclusive, and apparently deaf to Kronos Committee. I am being told that options are being considered to relieve some of the issues. The solutions, however, will cost the system more money. How much more? In a system that is already underfunded by approximately $2 million per school, should the Board of Education spend more money on just a timekeeping <laughs> system. The most consistent complaint about this is a system is how it affects my members' lunch. Before Kronos, members were able to take a half an hour lunch break if they wanted to. Now our members have to swipe out at the start of their lunch break and swipe back in at the conclusion of the lunch break. This system works okay when the uh, member works only a few feet or even a couple of yards away from the time <laughs> clock. The bulk of my members, however, don't. Some members who travel to various assignments and those working in large schools have either been docked or needed to go through major hoops to get their time adjusted. There are costly adjustments that are being recommended, but will still not alleviate this problem. I am asking that the swipe out for lunch and then back into the building um, after lunch be removed. The time clock comes with the built-in half-hour lunch break for seven-hour employees. I am asking that you utilize what the system offers instead of paying for the additional punches. I am also asking that the Kronos Committee be helped to become more realistic with its applications, solutions, and rollouts. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Baltimore County Public Schools Organization of Professional Employees, Nick Argyros. Arg Argyros. Argyros. Mr. Argyros. 
Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman Gill, Superintendent White, and board members. My name is Nick Argyros, and I'm the president of the Collective Bargaining Unit of Organization, Professional, Technical, and Supervisory Employees. OPE represents about 370 non-certificated employees. OPE was formed after the BCPS non-certificated employees were separated from CASE about three years ago. Our group is comprom uh, comprised of managers, supervisors, and technical employees from various departments such as technology, business services, facilities, transportation, HR, food service, finance, and budget. The professionals in our association work behind the scenes each day to serve the needs of the students, teachers, and administrators. OP's principal goal is to assure that our represented employees have a voice in the workplace. We serve their interests through the collective bargaining efforts which advocate for a safe, secure, fair, and healthy workplace. We strive to be much more than a collective bargaining unit. As a professional association, we are dedicated to expanding professional and personal opportunities for our members with resources available through BCPS and OPE. Our intended outcomes are twofold, a more effective professional association and a more effective BCPS. I want to know that we work very closely with the superintendent's office to be sure our efforts are in alignment with the systemic initiatives. <laughs> On behalf of OPE, I want to thank Mrs. White this evening for always being supportive of our employees. In addition, I want to thank Mrs. White for directing resources, providing support, and recognizing our professional employees for their dedicated services. She recently acknowledged that we are their infrastructure, we are the infrastructure that keeps the system running smoothly, and we greatly appreciate that. I look forward to reporting out on ongoing OP initiatives in future board meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education, Julie miller brett Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members, Ms. White, and the BCPS community. With the bi-monthly Board of Education meetings in which speaker after speaker spends three minutes requesting, admonishing, wheedling, begging, and pleading for changes to BCPS, and I include myself in this list, it could seem to the casual viewer that BCPS isn't doing anything right. So in the spirit of thanksgiving and good tidings, please allow me to set that to right. I have to begin with Wade Kearns, coordinator of the Office of Advanced Academics and his uber excellent staff of Robin Holly Briante, Wendy Ingalls, Jen Meehan, and Deborah Myers. Wade is always open and accessible to us and the whole team is thoughtful, knowledgeable, and a pleasure to work with. Given the sea changes that have been occurring in this office over the last several years, they have worked really hard at communicating how advanced academics works to our group, to BCPS teachers and staff, and to stakeholders. They have improved their website, held GT information nights across the county, including a recent appearance at the Southwest Area Advisory Meeting, and are working with us on developing some communication pieces that we think will further understanding. Wade has been front and central on the revision of policy 6401 and has done a really excellent job in listening to and talk, taking into consideration key points that the GTCAC believe need to be in place. We are also thankful for all the Board of Education members. For those who have come to our meetings and for those who plan to, we applaud your desire to become more knowledgeable about issues facing gifted and talented students. We see this knowledge in action when we hear conversations at curriculum meetings about how the district might better serve GT students and at PRC meetings when members are definitely discussing how policy 6401 relates back to Maryland statute and regulation and where policy language could be strengthened. We know you are listening and that is a mark of a good system. Finally, the BCPS administration that the GTCAC regularly interacts with from Superintendent Verlita White to Dr. Mary McComas to Dr. Renard Adam, or Evans is exceptional. At every meeting I have been to with them, their knowledge, compassion, and ability to look at the big picture without losing sight of the needs of individual students is clearly apparent. They listen and are ready to roll their sleeves up and see what can be done. How do we know this? Because of the results that we are seeing on a number of initiatives we have been pushing over the last couple of years. Our mission to get policy 6401 to, a, to be a strong and meaningful document that really serves the GT students in Baltimore County, that is well underway and a huge improvement over the last revision. Our goal to get a cognitive assessment in place in order to better identify GT students in typically underserved populations, plans are for field testing to begin in the fall of 2018. 
Our calls to improve staffing in the Office of Advanced Academics, they have been heard. Is everything perfect? Of course not. If you want to hear more about the areas of concern the GTCAC has identified and recommendations for continued improvements, then we encourage everyone interested to come to our next meeting with Superintendent White, which will be next week on Wednesday, December 13th at 7 p.m. here at Greenwood. But while we are working towards a better... Please know that there... Thank you. Our next speaker is from Case Tom DeHart. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, and Superintendent White, members of the board. I'm here tonight to remind you that CASE represents 577 BCPS employees, <laughs> including principals, assistant principals, supervisors, coordinators, and pupil personnel workers. They are the public face of our system on a daily basis. These are the folks who are in the trenches and are on the level of leadership that is integral to making a system work. I say this because leadership matters. In the near future, this board will have to decide on their next steps regarding the superintendency. There are basically three choices. You can petition the State Board of Education for another year of interim. You can conduct a search for a replacement, or you can sign our current superintendent to a permanent status. I will offer Case's recommendation. Our Case Executive Board voted unanimously to endorse Verlita White as the permanent superintendent. Additionally, we surveyed the 577 case eligible employees for their recommendation. Now you may know that in an internal survey, if you get 30 to 40% reply, it's considered successful. Our survey doubled that benchmark with 439 replies for a 76% reply rate. You need to know that the leaders in the system recommend Ms. White by a nine to one margin. Why? Because leadership matters. Three minutes does not afford me the time to delineate why Verlita White is the perfect candidate for a permanent superintendent, but I'd be sure to meet, I'd be uh, happy to meet with uh, members of the board either individually or collectively and share my thoughts. The fact that 90% of the building and office leaders in BCPS support her candidacy for the superintendency clearly indicates a belief and confidence in Verlita White as their leader. Simon Sinek, described by TED Talks as a powerful model for inspirational leadership, suggests there is a difference between being a leader and leading. He says, being a leader means you hold the highest rank, either by earning it, good fortune, or navigating internal politics. Leading, however, means that others follow you not because they have to, not because they are paid to, but because they want to. Ms. White understands this subtle difference and is the best candidate for the superintendent position because leadership matters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. DeHart. Uh, it's now time for public comment and our first speaker is Margaret Gibson. <coughs> Good, mor good evening, board members. This morning I spoke at the Maryland State Department of Education and was invited to come share my testimony tonight. I am Margaret Gibson, the mother to five dyslexic children and to many dyslexic nieces and nephews. All of my children have been through Baltimore County Public Schools, which has provided me a cumulative 32 years worth of experience working with the school system. My family story, as well as others, was just featured in the American Public Media's podcast, Hard to Read, How American Schools Fail Kids with Dyslexia. We are just a few of the many families who approach Decoding Dyslexia Weekly for support and information. I want the board to know that the issue of dyslexia is still a large one within BCPS. I know that our school system can and should do better. BCPS just passed the iReady contract and this warrants an audit of BCPS. Decoding Dyslexia is grateful that BCPS has taken the first step in beginning to train some teachers in Orton-Gillingham. Early screening is essential for remediation. We need to identify students in kindergarten. Research shows that early intervention can prevent reading failure, anxiety, and other comorbidities of failing in school. 
However, programs like iReady are not designed to identify or remediate a child with significant reading deficits. The two key indicators of persistent reading difficulties are significant difficulty with phonemic awareness and rapid automatized naming. BCPS's inappropriate implementation of iReady is causing harm to its students by not identifying the root cause of the reading deficit. Once a student is identified as needing support, they are already years behind. BCPS must collect baseline data on the student and continue with appropriate progress monitoring. I have been told by BCPS administration countless times that my child no longer needed intervention because they were making progress. Without baseline data, these claims could not be proven true or false. You just don't know where the student is going. This is why the school system must continue to train their teachers about struggling readers and the expected response to intervention. We know that all children benefit from multi-sensory structured literacy. The time is now to train all of our teachers in structured literacy and not use iReady as a substitute. Many members of Decoding Dyslexia and many other stakeholders presented these facts to BCPS's Board of Education as to why iReady was not an appropriate program for approximately 20% of their student population. Curriculum Associates, the makers of iReady, concurred that iReady is not designed to identify or remediate the dyslexic student. With this knowledge, BCPS's board still hastily voted to pass the iReady contract. I have asked the Maryland State Department of Education to audit Baltimore County. I would like to know why a contract was pushed through that does not meet the needs of children the county intended it to service. The county needs to implement early screening and appropriate early intervention for all struggling. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kimberly Fields. Hello, my name is Kimberly Fields and I am the AP at Woodbridge Elementary School. It is my pleasure to be here tonight to represent Woodbridge Elementary School. I'm joined tonight by my principal, um, Lori Phelps, who will speak um, later on tonight. Um, Shara Patera, my stat teacher, Teresa Lagna, a second grade teacher at my school, and four of the students enrolled at my school. Um, I'm also here in support of Ms. Verlita White as the permanent superintendent of Baltimore County Public Schools. During my tenure here at BCPS, I have known Ms. White to be a dedicated and passionate person who is um, excuse me, who is passionate about educating children, excuse me. Um, I'm sure you would rather hear um, from the children who are enrolled at my school. Um, this is Caden Richardson. He was not selected as a speaker tonight, so I wanted to ask permission to allow him to speak um, instead of me. Well, well, we don't allow that, but, but, but you can sh he can share some of your time um, right now if, okay. if, uh, if he is okay. ready to go. Thank you. teaches children how to use computers correctly. We are able to use websites that help us with different topics. And we are able to communicate with our teachers as needed and look at how great. I think devices are really cool, so please do not take it, take it from Baltimore County Schools. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening. I'm here to talk tonight about accountability, which is something that I have spoken about before. I have a job because, unfortunately, there are people in the county who feel that IEPs are one size fits all. That's not how education, special education works. The I in IEP stands for individualized. That means that one size does not fit all. IEPs are treated like a restaurant menu. I can pick one from column A, one from column B, and that's what I'm gonna follow, and the rest is not followed. IEPs are legal documents. 
It is not a teacher singly or an administrator's ability or job or right to decide whether or not a part of an IEP is going to be followed. You are to follow it as it is written. The only people that have that opportunity have that opportunity inside of a legal IEP team. Over the past couple of days, I have been in emergency IEP meetings that are resulting in me having to file in the near future at least one mediation. A parent, and I've said this before to this board, a parent should not have to go spend money to get a free and appropriate public education for their child. When they're spending money and I'm in the picture, it is no longer free. Again, IEPs need to be followed with fidelity. The biggest culprits that I have seen recently are middle and high schools who seem to feel that the moment a special needs child sets foot in their building, they no longer need an IEP. And they start cutting it down and, wait and saying things to me at meetings, when are we going to be able to wean the child from the IEP? The IEP is there for a reason. It needs to be followed with fidelity. And I think Varlita White is very well aware of that. Um, lastly, the biggest problem that we have as far as IEPs being followed is children's who, children who are 2E. If you have an IEP, you're not stupid. But if you're a gifted... Thank you. Our next speaker is, I believe it's Amay Nadim. <coughs> Hi, my name is Amal Nadim. I am a fifth grader at Woodbridge Elementary. I am here with my fellow student council members, my principal, a teacher from my school, and my stat teacher. I am here to talk about how devices are beneficial, how Dreambox and iReady is beneficial, and why we should keep Ms. White as our superintendent. Devices have helped me and my friends a lot. Devices allow us to research. They allow us to do Dreambox and iReady. They can help us share information in many different ways, such as essays, PowerPoints, movie makers, and many others. Dreambox and iReady allow us to know our learning level. They teach us lots of new things in fun ways. For example, Dreambox taught me how to multiply fractions when I didn't know. iReady is helpful because it teaches you at a certain level that you need to be better at or know more about. It tells you different things you need to know, such as using text evidence or finding details to make a main point. Lastly, I would like to talk about Miss White. Miss White came to Woodbridge on the first day of school. Even though I didn't get a chance to talk to her, I was able to tell she's a very hardworking woman. Miss White has put so much of her effort to make BCPS what it is today, and I think her hard work has led to many successes. I believe that we should keep, keep Miss White, Dreambox, iReady, in our devices. Thank you. Thank you, Amal. Our next speaker is Russ Kuhn. Hello, board members. Good evening. It's a tough act to follow, right? Um, but uh, I'm not going to counter point by point. Um, <laughs> but I've spoken here multiple times. Um, back when the one-to-one -one device idea was kicked around and we charged full throttle into it and we spent, I don't know, I've heard anywhere from $147 million to $200 plus million dollars on devices and BCPS stat and everything else that goes with it. Um, and I've objected to such a, a, a large amount of spend so quickly. I believe that there are ways to reduce that spend. I talked about um, uh, Chromebooks uh, that are much less expensive. 
uh, way to, to provide devices. I don't believe that we need one-to-one -one devices for all students and all um, class sizes. I have five children. My kindergartner came home today and was pestering me to play Dreambox because it's fun. And yes, life is, it's great when life can be fun. But I have concerns about Dreambox and I've talked about them and the privacy concerns two plus years ago sitting in the same spot uh, where on their website they sit there and talk about the 50,000 points of data that they collect per hour of interaction uh, with a student. So I don't know if you all are aware of this. Um, but it's concerning to me that there's massive amounts of data being collected on our students and kept by third parties that I don't believe that we have um, enough control over. Um, there's a lot of things that, that, that I would like to talk about, but I've got about a, a minute and 15 seconds left, so that's going to keep it down. Uh, but, you know, I've heard um, uh, a teacher come up and speak. I've heard Case, whatever that is, come and talk about their leadership. Uh, that leadership matters. I believe it matters. I, I believe Superintendent White um, seems like a very nice person, and I think you've had, um, you know, really great um, professional experience at BCPS. My question uh, to the board is, how do we compete a job that's as important as a superintendent position and come out with a fair result? Um, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, lobby against uh, Superintendent White. I think she should have a shot at the job. She's acting uh, at this point in time. Uh, but I am concerned um, that we're taking an incumbent from inside uh, a school system and, and handing her a job when there might be other folks out there that, that um, are as, if not more, qualified. So I, would I wanted to share that. I am concerned about um, other things that I've read in the newspapers recently, and I look forward to um, results that we're going to have coming. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lori Phelps. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, congratulations, and school board members. I am the principal of Woodbridge Elementary. I had an opportunity to meet many of you on the first day of school, and I want to thank you again for visiting us. As you can see from the many people behind me, Woodbridge is in the house tonight. This very impressive group of individuals includes my assistant principal, whom you've already heard from, members of my leadership team, and members of our student council, as well as their parents, and Delegate Sidnor, whose children attend our school. I invited our student council members and their parents to join me in attending the board meeting tonight because it is the perfect opportunity for them to practice their leadership skills by advocating for something that matters to them, as I am. Since the loudest voices are often those with negative things to say and complain about, it's time for those of us who are normally more comfortable standing in the background to speak up. I'm also a member of the Case Executive Board, and I have to say I am so proud of the voice that our organization has found under the leadership of Tom DeHart. And although Sean McCombs and uh, Tom DeHart are a tough act to follow, I'm gonna do my best. Verlita White is the right choice to be our next superintendent for several reasons. Number one, she has more knowledge and experience of teaching and learning than anyone else in our system. And it's nice to have a boss who knows more than you do. Number two, she has institutional knowledge that takes years to accumulate that can save time and effort in identifying and fixing problems. Number three, she has the unwavering support of the system's administrators and central office staff, which you've already heard about. And number four, she bases her decisions on what's best for children. Those four combined elements answer the question that the last speaker raised. Why would you look for another candidate anywhere else? Because no candidate any search firm could drum up could have those four elements. It matters that principals and central office staff support Ms. White. 
The average tenure of a superintendent is a little over three years. If our system is to move forward, administrators can't stand back and just wait out the tenure of a new superintendent. We have a window of opportunity to truly propel our district forward because Ms. White doesn't have to build a coalition, she already has one. You can't buy loyalty, you have to earn it, and she has. Under her leadership, we are all pulling in the same direction, and when that happens, everybody wins. Students, parents, staff, and taxpayers. Because good schools are good business. And Ms. White, as the BC Pest superintendent, means we will have those good schools. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to the team. Our next speaker is Aza Khan. Good, good evening, everyone. Hello, my name is Isa Khan, and I'm a third grader at Warwick Elementary School. I'm here tonight to talk to the board about keeping devices in the school. I enjoy using the databases and programs like iReady and Dreambox. These programs help me learn independently and at my own pace. It makes learning fun and different. VoiceThread is a great tool for everyone in the class to be heard. We can listen to each other's ideas and learn from each other. Please continue to let us have devices in our school. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ethan. I am a third grader from Woodbridge Elementary. I'm here to tell how devices are useful. Devices share useful information like Dreambox taught me how to multiply factors and iReady is a helpful because it helps us at a certain level such as text evidence or main point. Now I want to talk about Miss White. She is a very hard working person. I believe we can keep Miss White, iReady, Dreambox and our devices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Our next speaker is Faith Bryce. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, my name is Faith Bryce, and I'm a Randallstown High School parent as well as the Randallstown High School PTSA president. The Baltimore County School System needs to fill the position of superintendent, and Verlita White is the ideal candidate for that job. Verlita White grew up in the Baltimore County public school system is a, and is an outstanding representation of the best that the school system um, has to offer. She is a proud graduate of Whitlawn High School and an accomplished administrator. Ms. White has effectively served as the chief academic officer for the Baltimore County public school system for years. Ms. White uses her past experience as a BCPS teacher and administrator to guide the curriculum within the school system because she, she understands the needs at the ground level. Ms. White has been instrumental in laying the groundwork for the STAT initiative and moving it forward to ensure that the use of technology is effectively balanced with instruction to assure a competitive future for our students. During her tenure, BCPS has received numerous awards and accolades from around the world for its innovation and cutting edge approach to education. Verlita White played a strategic role in reducing the minority graduation gap. She works to ensure that equity in education is a part of how BCPS makes and implements policy that impacts the future of our school system. As an administrator and a BCPS parent, Verlita White continues to be an outstanding advocate and representative of Baltimore County Schools and its families. Ms. White played a significant role in making sure that the voices of Randallstown parents, students, and staff were heard to ensure that we got a principal that was right for our school and committed to student success. That principal is Mr. Aubrey Brown, the BCPS Secondary 2017 Principal of the Year. Over the past several months, Felita White has effectively served as the interim Baltimore County Superintendent. Under, their leadership, under her leadership, the transition into the school year has been seamless. The parents, students, and staff of Randallstown High School are firmly against the efforts of some board members to use our hard-earned tax dollars to fund a national search for a superintendent when we have an ideal candidate in Verlita White. 
Ms. White is a product of Baltimore County Public Schools with a proven track record of excellence. She has an outstanding relationship with the BCPS faculty, staff, and community leaders with a clear understanding of the climate and needs of Baltimore County. We, the parents, students, and staff of Randallstown High School wholeheartedly urge the Board of Education to appoint the most qualified candidate to the role of Superintendent of Baltimore County Public Schools. The candidate is Verlita White. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nina Jenkins. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Mina Jenkins, and I am the Randallstown High School parent of a graduating senior and the former president of the Randallstown High School PTSA. We are of the opinion that Verlita White is indeed the ideal candidate for the job of superintendent. At the point when we were searching for a superintendent and we received Dr. Dance, I went to multiple meetings within the community asking for a leader who would be able to address the concerns and the needs of the school system, also be able to allow the parents to have a voice within that system, and be supportive of the changes in technology that were going forward, and that's who we had. As part of that leadership was Ms. Verlita White. She has played a significant role in advancing the initiatives that were set by the board. And I will quite honestly say, when we started off with STAT, I wasn't necessarily on board. I thought it was starting from the wrong direction putting one-on-one -on -one devices in the hands of younger kids. Why not start at the high school level? Maybe I'm biased because my child was in high school. He may not necessarily reap the benefits of that. But when you walk around and you see every day, even in our own homes, that if you have a young child and you leave your cell phone just for a minute, that is the first thing that they're going to grab and they're going to use. And they know how to use it because that's how they learn. I don't think we should be afraid of the technology that we have and the opportunity that BCPS has granted our students in being able to pursue stats and education and technology to advance the, the concerns of this world, to be able to cure diseases because they've learned in a different manner. I think with Verlita White at the helm of BCPS that we have a shot of making sure that Baltimore County does not go off the rails yet again. We start a new policy, we follow it for a few years, we go through the change, and then we switch directions. At the point where we switch directions, it always ends in chaos. This is one of the few transitions that I've seen within the school system where we have not had a bump in the road changing leadership. This school year started off seamlessly. I did not expect that, but that's what we have. And when you get to the point where I have now had two kids go through BCPS, that from a parent's perspective speaks volume because consistency and leadership are important. Direction and guidance are important. And what I don't understand is why we would look outside the system. Isn't Verlita White what we want? Our kids to be able to go through BCPS, to be able to say, I am a product of the school system, to reach a level of accomplishment, to be able to give back and contribute to those who contributed so much to her. We firmly believe that Verlita White is the ideal candidate for this job. You need to look no further. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Good evening to all. First, thank you really for the microphones. I would have preferred Barbie mics because I think the problem is that sometime even with a long one, it would not so. Please speak up into the mic. We want to hear you. We want to be heard and, and we want to hear you too. Um, my second point today is that I have watched uh, Miss White uh, sitting there for so many long years and um, very briefly, um, I know she has the knowledge, and I know she has the credibility. Uh, in medicine, you know, you say to err is a human. You know, there is no one that don't make any mistakes, and I think it's really very important for us to know that Ms. White has the credibility and the experience, and she really cares. I mean, just really observing her time after time, she really cares about the system. Um, I would like to spend the, 
the time I have with the first policy, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chairman. Well, this is the public comment time, and uh, after you're finished, whatever your comments are, you are the first speaker on our nine um, uh, policies. So if you're com concluded your uh, public comment time, then we'll, uh, you have signed up for all nine, so you can just stay right there and we can invite others as, as their names are called. Two minutes. Have you have two. a minute and a half on your public comment time. All right, so, um, all right, I wouldn't abuse the system. Uh, that's the end of my comment. Very good. All right, so now it is time for us to have public comment on nine different policies that are <laughs> up for general public comment. The first is proposed changes to policy 8130, internal board policies, organization policy formation. Dr. Ferrone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can we aggregate all of them so we don't have a buzzer in between? I'm not going to take 27 minutes. Can um, we just certainly. do it all straight? Certainly. You won't, you, won't, you, won't have, you won't have 27 minutes because there's nine. So how much time do you need for your? I don't think it would be that much. I think it would be more cost effective if I just really go through them. That's fine. Um, uh, and uh, we'll put the brakes on if we need to, but we'll keep a separate clock Thank without you. running that clock. Thank you. Um, I really, truly appreciate the PRC. So this is really my, my input. And their policy 8130 and their item A, number one, each year the board chair shall choose members of PRC. My recommendation here is really for uh, the system to allow public to be members of the PRC, because it's really about engagement. It's about communication with the public early on in the process, not just in the second reading. And there is a second item, which is A2. The policy says conducting regularly scheduled meetings to review um, PRC reviews policies. My suggestion to you is really to add to write new policies. So members of the PRC needs to be able to review, but also if they deem to be necessary, they can have the ability to write a policy and put it in the system up and forward. And their item A to B, uh, it states collaborating with superintendent. And in that, my recommendation is to say to review or write or revise or revision of policies. Again, it's really about the ability of to doing all three of them. And their item A2D, as in David, making recommendations to the board for, my recommendation is to add writing a new policy or a policy adoption or revisions. Again, it's the same point. And their item A2E, reporting to the board in full session. I honestly don't understand the word full session. I mean, always, you know, 14 years, you are in full session each the time. There is no half session or quarter session. So I thought the word full is kind of redundant. Um, and their item B, new policies, it suggests regarding school policies may originate from any source, including parents, et cetera. So what I thought is, you know, might be better to omit including a parent, a member, et cetera, because when you say any source, any source means all sources. And their item C, B, it says where appropriate, cost analysis and fiscal impact, et cetera. Um, my suggestion here is to define the word appropriate. I have been a physician for 43 years, and it is one man or woman's appropriateness is another person's wrongdoing. So to me, it's very elastic, very inappropriate to say appropriate and not really define what that means. And there are item C, E, similar policies adopted by other Maryland local schools. What I thought here that we always really advocate our globalness, you know, our getting our students to be global. So 
if we have something to learn from other schools around us, that's fine. If we have ability to borrow from schools in other states, that would be fine. But also, if we have really something to learn from Western Europe or Vietnam or China or whatever, you know, that needs to be appropriate too. The idea is that we borrow what is suitable for us wherever it came from. And their item four, letter A, the adoption of new policies or Um, it's about the public commenting on policies. My recommendation is really for the public to be allowed to comment on the first reading, on the second reading, and on the third reading. As you've seen in history, probably very rarely really other people would comment on policies except me, all right? And I don't abuse the system as far as minutes, etc. So, you know, I may be available in the first reading, not really in the second reading, all right? You know, why not? The idea is engagement with the public. And their item four, letter B, nothing in this paragraph shed, shall preclude the Board of Education from waiving the third reading. I watched the board for so many years. I really think waiving the third reading for whatever reason tells the public and the watchers of the board that we really haven't done our job in a timely fashion. We are just trying to rush it in. I think we really should stick for the three readings in all the times. And um, uh, waving it is just rushing it, things in. Um, and their item five, to the end of the paragraph, it says, direct the superintendent to revise any administrative rule that the board may determine to be inconsistent with any policies adopted by the board, okay? My, my thought here, if you follow my rationale, it's not just really about the policies of the board. I think really any rule or any, anything really we, we do in this school system should comply with the board votes and policies, but also should comply with state and federal statutes, all right? And then I recommend to you to add to the best interest of BCPS students. I thought of this is, is because we, we really need to always be focused on students and the best interest of those students. So adding that sentence, I think will give it that focus. Uh, under item six, the board shall implement this policy. As I mentioned to you before, I really don't know what that means. Um, yeah, of course the board should implement it, but the board doesn't have really police force uh, to kind of um, <laughs> force, you know, like the court system have the marshals, et cetera. Uh, the FBI has their, their people, uh, et cetera. I mean, you know, I, I don't really truly understand that word. Second policy, which is policy 8222 is Uh, I mentioned to you this before. I know state law basically uh, puts the superintendent as the executive and also the treasurer and secretary. My recommendation for you as board to consider lobbying or suggesting to the General Assembly to separate those three powers. You just imagine if President Trump is the secretary of state and treasurer in the same time. All right, you know, uh, separating them, I think, would be wiser in nature. Uh, and their item two, duties, and then there is letter A and number two, propose annual and operating and capital budget that suits the needs of PCS uh, to the board. So I thought of that because of the problems that we had before. I think the board should always ask what is suitable for our students, our employees, teachers, and then it's up to the higher authority not to provide it or provide it um, completely. We really need to ask. Um, under item two, letter A, number seven, 
I thought of adding implement the words of federal state laws and also the Board of Education of Maryland, Maryland State Board of Education. Uh, in essence, we clearly should comply with our rules and the state and the federal in the same time. Under item two, letter A, number eight, compile and present info, information useful and as directed. And that's usually the task of the chair, which is admirable. However, I thought, watching the board for so many years, that there are board members who may have information. And I think that should be allowed if the majority of the board members voted for that. In other words, the information should not really come only from the chair, all right? It can come also from majority vote. And there are item two, letter B, number three and number four. You would see that, that the agenda is always concentrated in the hand of the chair or maybe superintendent, I'm not really sure, but the idea is that it's concentrated in one person. And many times, board members, some, would have really great things to talk about, and they cannot do that unless we have unanimous vote. Uh, I think it's more democratic and more positive if majority vote of the board wants to add an item to allow that. That's democratic in nature, and I think it would be positive in nature. Policy 8230 talks about new board members being subjected, subjected to orientation. And I thought the word orientation in English, okay, I'm a foreigner, but, uh, you know, anyhow, orientation doesn't really give what it means. You know, a new board member needs to be educated about the policies, educated about the budget, which is really so complex, educated about safety and so forth. So I thought that we replace the word orientation with education of the new board members. Concern in that policy is about who educates the new board member. So you can imagine if a board member is um, of a certain uh, um, political venue, right? Those who are educating that board member may not really do it in as good a way as a board member that is more of their favor there would be potential bias in that. And I really ask you as a board to think about that and, and to have maybe a better way of, of doing it. Policy 8250, how am I doing with the time, Mr. Chairman? Uh, you said you were gonna be fast, but you've been 12 minutes now. Oh, okay, so I have plenty of time, thank you. Uh, you were gonna be fast, that was the deal. 8250. Because you have given it to us in writing as well. Yes, thank you. Um, 8250 under item one believes the board member must be personally present at the board meeting. I really ask you not to take my, my comments in a wrong way, right? The, the physical presence of a board member, watching board members for 14 years, does not really mean a thing. You know, a person could be sitting there for a whole year and not really say much or say very few things or not really contribute positively. So what does that mean? The person has 100% attendance perfect, but not necessarily really advanced the, uh, the business of the school system. I think board members should be allowed in the 2017 to participate through electronics, um, you know, such as go to meeting or log me in or Skype or whatever, if that's really necessary. It would not really be the rule, but it would be positive for someone who has positive contribution but is on a way and needs to attend the uh, board meeting and contribute to it when they are in Arkansas or Hawaii, et cetera. Um, and there are item two, board members shall attend all meetings, both public and, or special. Uh, again, this is linguistic, all meetings, all means all, right? So why say public or special? 
unless all doesn't mean 100%. So I suggest omit the word public and special. And there item 3A, each board member notify of non-attendance in advance. I find this um, needs explanation. What does that in, in advance mean? Five minutes be, before the meeting, one minute before the meeting, 15 minutes after the meeting, one day before. I really think it needs to be identified. And then the word good, good cause, um, and again, I am physician for 43 years. Uh, this is a very rubbery, elastic word. What's a good cause, right? Well, the good cause for me might not be the same for another one. So if my wife gave me a hard time, said, don't go to the Board of Education today, I need you, is that a good cause? Yeah, she can lock me up, you know, so. All right. So, you know, request that you would define that. I want to put a pitch really for all of you today, all right? Uh, this policy says that you are being paid $100 annually. Is that right? Correct? Okay. I, I really think that's really poor, all right? <laughs> I, I mean, I mean you, you might as well really just, you know, not really accept that. Uh, it is just, <laughs> it's just not really right, okay? So, finally, all this policy, I find it that it is... Um, uh, you know, needs to be identified in a better way. Um, you know, we need to define um, wh what's the best interest of students, okay? That's variable. Um, and it doesn't really say anything about scorecard of board members. So, you know, there was one time in my presentations, I asked you as board members, especially the new one, to make um, to tell us really what's your agenda, what you plan to do, and really to put it on the walls behind us, and then at the end of the year to put a scorecard and see really how much each board member uh, you know, accomplished, all right? It, it would be the right thing to do from the public. I think it would be the right thing for board members. Uh, policy 8270 duties of committees, and they are advisory in nature. My thought here for your consideration is to allow the public to speak, to attend and to speak if so needed in these standing committees. Okay, I think that would be a positive thing. It's democratic, it would be better for all of us. Um, special assignment committee uh, special assignment does not really state, that's item two, letter B, does not really state what special assignment is. Um, that vagueness is a con you know, concern on my part. Policy 8280. Um, this policy at addresses the, atten the attendance of national meetings for continuous improvement and professional development. So, I have been attending the calendar committee since 2004, all right? Professional days are not really as vital as they are advertised for. I understand the need for them, but again, I want to appeal to you that we have in our school system the stat, we have all the electronics, et cetera. It's 2017 for teachers to be educated and communicating. It really needs to be in the days of Skype, go to meetings, log me in, emails, et cetera. It doesn't have to be really specific physically in four, uh, four days every year. And I think in sometimes these professional days may turn into a perk rather than a real benefit uh, for the educational system. Not for everybody, but I think that's potentially can be the Policy 8311, it's about operations. Establish guidelines for. I thought really here that we, 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 you know, should consider to add in accordance of state, federal law, and also add Robert's rules. Item two, number B, letter B, uh, from September through June, unless such days conflict with holidays. Again, the word holidays is just really holidays. It doesn't really say what holidays they are. In that, my recommendation is that you would add the non, the uh, Komar holidays. So it's really specifically uh, states that we would not really meet if 
it conflicts with Comar holidays. And there are item three, number two, I think it says program and it should be programs um, in the plural. And then uh, in that same uh, line, the wording says reserve the right to receive public comments. And I think that reserve the right is unclear, it's dubious. I think the board needs to always be clear that the public has the right and is encouraged to come in and speak to the board, you know, within those three minutes. Uh, and phrasing it in that way gives me when I read it that it is not exactly as strong. Special meetings suggest here that a special meeting can be called by majority members petition. And I think that would advance again if you have six or seven members that want special meeting, um, then it must be really real. If you have one or two, it's not, all right? So why quell those members that really want to bring a problem into the public and into discussion, all right? I think a majority vote should be able to allow for a special meeting. Policy 8212. Uh, under item one, the statement says, policy is governed by state law. And here again, I, you know, we do not really live in just in, inside the state, we live uh, within the county, within the state, and also within the United States itself. And then it says, conduct of business. Okay, so my recommendation here is to add conduct of business in open, comma, public, comma, ethical manner, and in the best interest of all BCPS students according to federal and state law. Again, I'm trying to be clear in it. When I read it, the way it's phrased, it, it can be interpreted in, a, in different ways. Uh, the board meets regularly. The word regularly is vague. You know, it could be regularly once a year, it could be regularly every quarter, it could be every month or every week. And I, I, I think that needs to be clarified. Closed meetings. I, I need you to bear with me with closed meetings. I'm not a lawyer, you know, I'm not pretending to be one, all right? I didn't sleep in Holiday Inn. So um, I, as a public person, have the right to know what the school lawyers are presenting to you and asking you to approve what they have approved in closed meetings. I don't need to know the names, date of birth, the residence, social security number, but I only need to know, is it about teacher who is molesting someone? Is it about someone using drugs in school? Is it about someone incompetent? It needs to be told to us as public in some general terms that we know what's going on and not really just a number being presented in the meetings. Policy 8320, it's about operations. And I, I thought this, you know, operations is really a very extensive and complex matter. I thought it is brief policy and it is vague. So with that, I talked about the microphones and I already commented that to you. Uh, I thought here we should really be clear uh, that we follow Robert's rules. Sometime when I'm sitting in the back and listening to the discussion, I can read uh, Mr. Chairman's kind of difficulties with back and forth uh, with amendments and sometimes it's not really clear amendment and then there is a change of that amendment. I think we really need to be more specific and I think if we say according to Robert's rules and you know follow it would be really much better for all of us. It looks like you completed your, I your opus here. Mm -hmm. Oh, how many minutes do I have left? You have, you, you have saved a couple of minutes, but you, uh, um, but I thank you very much for your comments. Thank you, Dr. Farron. Okay, thank you all. I did uh, email each one of you just in case. Very good, so. thanks. Our uh, next speaker is Russ Kuhn, who has signed up to speak on proposed changes to policy 8222, internal board policies, duties, and responsibilities, superintendent, executive officer, secretary, and treasurer. Mr. Kuhn. Uh, so bear with me, this is my first time actually speaking about a policy. Um, I just had a general comment to start out with is, 
you know, as, as somebody that doesn't have um, endless amount of time to research this stuff, it would be useful to understand the changes that, and they're marked or have the old policy and the new policy to compare, um, because I'm, I don't actually know where to find that information. I started to search and I ran out of time before coming here. Um, so I don't have a lot to say, um, but I, I do want to ask a question um, and, and kind of follow on a little bit about uh, what the good doctor had to say. If we look at um, under two duties, uh, number eight, um, it talks about directed by the board chair, and, and I understand the chair is important. Um, um, and it's talking about compiling and presenting information. Um, in order for the board to function, uh, the members, all the members need to have access to timely information uh, along with the public, but the oversight uh, is charged with this board. So um, uh, the board chair becomes the gatekeeper of information as written here. So if I'm a member, if there's four or five members that are interested in certain information, um, uh, but the board chair doesn't feel like uh, he wants to go down that rabbit hole or that tangent, <clears throat> then then they're stymied at trying to get that information and bring those points forward. So I would suggest that that gets modified uh, to allow for a majority, a submajority, or or even any any member can ask for and get get data as required, because that's how how boards need to operate. And then I'm going to move on to section C. Superintendent is treasurer. Um, I'm not exactly clear on, on that point one. It says act as custodian of all funds belonging to the, and under the control of the board. So I'm sure you all followed it. I believe it was in Howard County. There was kind of a bloody battle between the board and the superintendent. And uh, there was language involved um, in, in the powers that the superintendent had. And she had to sign off on all expenditures of the board and she went sign off on the lawyers that the board had hired to basically battle the superintendent. So it was it was quite an interesting uh, construct there. Um, not that I hope that that ever happens here, uh, but I think a board needs to be independent, and the funds that they control, they need to control. It doesn't need to be um, owned by or managed by uh, the superintendent. Uh, so I think um, severing that duty would be useful. So I don't have anything else to say Great. about this well, policy. Well, don't leave because you also signed up for policy 8312, internal board policies, operations, public meetings. All right, 83. 8312. Bear with me. There's a lot of paper here. Mm -hmm. 8312. All right. The second to the last policy on the All right, you got list. policy and then you got the useless um, policy discussions that somebody's put together, the analysts. So um, I will try and find it. E312. Okay. All right. So so my main question here really was what is changing? Because you know, I, I I'm guessing by looking at the policies that have been provided are are the the things that are bolded or in all caps is being modified somehow. Um, again, I have no idea what's changing here, and and that's concerning. And I and and my other comment is, I understand by law, it's either I think it's five years you're changing it to seven years. You have to update policies and vote on them, kind of recurring just to keep them fresh, I guess. Um, uh, and and that's probably why half of these policies are coming up tonight. I guess, I don't know uh, if anyone can answer that. Um, uh, but I, I, would, I would suggest that, um, you know, you follow the law, Maryland Open Meeting Act, and also um, work with the public as much as you can to accept comments uh, because we are a large stakeholder. There's a lot of money poured into the system and we have limited resources. So we have battles going on for where those resources go. That's what your oversight provides by, by managing the budget and directing the priorities. So with that, I'm going to stop talking so we can end the session. Thank, Thank you. you.
Our next speaker is Sharon Saroff, who has signed up to speak on policy 8312, with the we've just spoken, and then also 8320. What I wanted to speak to you about was um, the part of this policy that talks about advance notice, reasonable advance notice. One of the things that I have found in being in this state of Maryland for the past 16 years is a problem with communication. Um, I'm not from the state, obviously, <laughs> and I did take as my minor public uh, publicity, public relations. So when I make a phone call and I find to find out when something's happening, I want to know all the information. I don't want to know from somebody saying to me, well, I don't know when somebody hasn't told me and I don't have the agenda in front of me. Um, I didn't know what policies were being discussed tonight until I came into this room tonight. The only place that I know of that I can find that information is on your website. And if something's wrong with my computer, I can't get a hold of this information. So I would ask the board to make a concerted effort to maybe think about all the people that don't have access to a computer, don't have access to a television. I do know several people, I do know many people in this county that don't have access to those items. Um, and don't, or they don't use those items for whatever reason, that there are other ways of announcing to the public when the board meeting is taking place, what time, the location, and what you're covering. So that a person like myself, who has a very busy schedule, doesn't walk in and then find out what's being discussed tonight and whether or not I want to make a public comment. Um, I also think that you would have a lot more people commenting on these things if they were publicized a lot better. The final. Um uh, policy that you signed up to speak on is 8320, Internal Board Policies Operations Final Action by the Board. Right, and, and the only thing I, I wanted to say about that was the Board shall implement um, this policy. The Board shall implement that. I'm trying to figure out why we're even, as the last person said, what, what is the change here from the previous policies? And that's, again, you know, something that I don't have uh, available to me. Um, it says implementation, the board shall implement this policy. Well, I would say the board should implement all policies with fidelity. As I said, accountability is important in special education. Accountability is important with this board. Um, that's all I have to say. Very good, thank you. The next item on our agenda is item G, and that's the superintendent's report. Mrs. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So congratulations, uh, Mr. Gillis and Mr. Stewart, on your appointments. I look forward to working with both of you. Um, there are recent awards that speak to the talents and dedication of our staff in support of our students and schools. So I'd like to highlight some of those this evening. First, we are thrilled with this morning's news that West Towson Elementary School was named a Maryland Blue Ribbon School. Now we have a total of 24 Maryland Blue Ribbon Schools. I want to give a special recognition to our principal, Sue Hirschfeld, and to her staff and students and community members for their pursuit of excellence demonstrated through high student performance and thriving Spanish instruction through our Passport program. West Towson is our first LEED certified school indicating environmental safety. This school's are also earned an award for implementing healthy practices that impact student performance and it is a professional development school dedicated to training teacher interns from Towson University. So will you join me in congratulating West Towson Elementary School? Yeah. 
Additionally, a few weeks ago, our county executive, Kevin Kamenetz, honored our seven high schools named among the region's best by Niche, a company that analyzes a wide swath of data to rank schools. I want to congratulate our, the leaders, staff, and students of the following schools for their efforts. Catonsville High School, Delaney High School, Eastern Technical High School, George Washington Carver, Center for Arts and Technology, Hereford High School, Towson High School, and Western School of Technology and Environmental Science. So congratulations to those schools. <laughs> also, no less than eight of our art teachers were honored by the Maryland Art Education Association at their annual award ceremony. We appreciate staying at the forefront of art education leadership to support well-rounded instruction in our schools. Finally, last week, four elementary teachers were recognized with the Bright Ideas Teacher Grant from BGE for innovative STEM project proposals. <coughs> so we are proud of our teachers and administrators who work hard every day with and for children. To that end, we have to make sure that we continue to secure appropriate resources for the use by our students and by our teachers as well. Therefore, I've recently asked staff to develop requests for proposals related to the learning management system and for student and teacher devices. Over the past several years, feedback from focus groups has guided our decision making. Likewise, I have had, had the opportunity to gather feedback this year from community meetings and from my advisory councils on instructional resources that are needed for 21st century learning. Based on the feedback received, RFPs were launched, as I believe, as uh, good stewards of our taxpayer dollars. We need to continue to assure the public that we are um, securing the best resources at the best price for the best instructional program possible for students and for teachers. So it now is the time for us to take a for a pause for to take a pause for a second and to reevaluate and to make sure that we have the best resources at the best price for the best instructional program possible. We are still in the early stages of this process, but we will keep the board and the public informed along the way. So I know that this is um, the just, we just returned from one holiday and we're looking at another. This is my last report, however, before the winter break. So I would like to just take a moment to wish the board members a very happy holiday season, as well as all of our staff and teachers, administrators, community members as well, a very restful and happy holiday season. This month's star video um, it's a look at literacy across the content areas. I'm sure that those of you who have been around me, um, you probably have heard this ad nauseum, but I really do believe that literacy is a foundational skill and it is at the heart of every single thing that we do. I'm so encouraged by the way that our teachers and administrators have really taken on the charge of providing literacy, rich literary experiences across the disciplines um, throughout our schools. And so this month's star video really emphasizes future ready skills that our students need to graduate on time to enter college and career and to thrive and persist while there. So with that, I'll turn over to the video. At Red House Run Elementary School, there is something that you cannot miss. As soon as you walk in the building, the hallways, the gym, and classrooms. How did this come about? I think the mindset of the teachers have changed. And as a result, the mindset of the children have changed. While we have to teach core content, it's now all interrelated. Science isn't just science and ELA isn't just ELA. The tests are more authentic and they're of greater interest to the students. All right, boys and girls, as you know, in science, we've been talking a lot about natural disasters, specifically talking about erosion and the damaging effects of that. So today, we have a real-world problem that we're going to be solving. Here at Red House Run, literacy and math comes down to comprehension. 
Students need to be able to demonstrate that they have a deeper understanding of the material, moving away from just memorizing basic facts. In my math class, we spend a lot of time looking at real life problems, and students need to be able to apply their math skills to help solve real world problems. If students can explain what a problem means, it shows that they have a deeper understanding of what the material is and what the question is asking. They also have to be able to explain in writing how they solve the problem and the steps they took to solve it. Our interest in literacy was renewed this past summer after hearing the presentation that Interim Superintendent White offered. I brought her ideas back to the leadership team and they ran with it. Then when the teachers returned to school, it was like a snowball effect. When I see literacy displayed on the walls, it makes me think of what I do in my, in my reading writing class every day, like reading, writing, speaking, and communicating. It's what I do all throughout the school day. We demonstrate literacy throughout the school day by reading, writing, and speaking. By, for example, just the other day in ELA, we were learning about frogs. We learned about their life cycle, habitat, and what they eat. We read about, spoke about, and wrote about frogs. In fact, it was like doing science at the same time. Orange group, you're in your research phase. You are working in a literacy circle first, so you're working as a collaborative group. We want students to utilize the skills that they learn throughout ELA in the real world and throughout all different content areas. For example, right now we're researching about climate change, so they're researching multiple different sources, and then they're using the information they've learned to create a presentation to help prevent climate change and help the Earth. Literacy does not stop in the classroom, it's threaded throughout the school. And my letter jumpers, how many times should you be jumping? Ten times we are jumping over our jump rope. Some people think that when they walk into an elementary school gym, they're going to see students just playing sports. Our goal as physical educators is to develop physically literate individuals. Can you show me a giraffe? How tall can you get? Literacy is at the core. Love it, Esther! That's just the way it is at Red House Run. <laughs> Mr. Chair, that is my report. Thank you, Thank you Mrs. White. <laughs> Next is the uh, Chair's report. Uh, three things. Uh, one, I, uh, I uh, hope that all of you had a great Thanksgiving uh, time away from work and with family. Thanksgiving is indeed a great time to uh, have a few days uh, to spend time with family. Uh, so I hope the break was uh, was uh, rejuvenating for you. Uh, last week we uh, we were able to celebrate the groundbreaking of um, of work at Woodlawn Senior High School, and the the Senior High Choir was there, the Senior High Band was there, uh, elected officials were there, and it was a great celebration of the uh, the work that is already underway and and will be transformative, particularly on the inside at Woodlawn Senior High School. So that was great, and I was able to join uh, Mrs. White this afternoon at uh, the state education headquarters to, uh, to celebrate West House and Elementary's Blue Ribbon um, Award. And it is indeed uh, a great honor. You know, there are only six schools across the state every year that get Blue Ribbon honors. Uh, so definitely uh, Baltimore County Public Schools are doing something right to be in uh, that elite group. Um, speaking of doing things right, it's time for Josie Schaefer to talk. <laughs> OK. Ooh. First, I would like to say that I'm really proud of the students of Woodbridge Elementary School for, they're probably home, it's eight. Uh, <laughs> I'm really proud of them though, that student activism at such a young level in elementary school, that's so crazy. I wish I was in student council in elementary school. I'm really proud of them. Go Woodbridge. <laughs> um, so good evening and happy Tuesday. This week, many students around Baltimore County will participate in Hour of Code, a global event where students are introduced to computer science. From kindergarten to 12th grade, students are able to create games, mazes, Google Doodles, robots, and music, all while learning the basics of computer programming. This will open the door to the world of STEM for many students who, through one hour of coding in school, can find their passion. I'm so glad BCPS gave students the opportunity to expand their learning past traditional school subjects and find an activity that they love. And I look forward to coding for an hour tomorrow at Pikesville. Um, speaking of STEM, 100 students in career and technology programs throughout the county met last week at the second annual Shark Tank at the Engineer Club. 
Since the beginning of the school year, engineering students have been working to make an invention to solve a real, real world problem. At the Shark Tank, students presented their ideas to professional engineers to try to take their invention from an idea to reality. I am so proud of these insanely smart and creative students for coming up with solutions for improving drinking water, water conservation, overheating smartphones, just to name a few. Again, it is so important for students to have the chance to take specific classes or do certain activities that they see themselves pursuing after they graduate. I met with students from Franklin High School on November 15th with BCSC President Jake Turner to discuss the school's climate and culture. Baltimore County is a large school district with a diverse student body, so it's important for me as a board member to understand student life at different schools. Even though I'm a student, my experiences at Pikesville are not the same as Franklin's. I had such a great time talking to students about the issues that are important to them, such as air conditioning, class schedules, bathrooms, and devices. I would like to thank the students that sacrificed eating with their friends to speak with Jake and me. And I'm so grateful for the Franklin High School's SGA advisors for setting up the meeting, and I can't wait to visit more schools soon. Um, lastly, a few hours ago, BCPS TV and I filmed my first episode of On the Move with Josie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good. <laughs> it's a show that goes around to different clubs throughout the county. Um, the show is designed <laughs> the show, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the show is designed to highlight student leaders that are not just student government and National Honor Society. Um, at times, we pool the same group of students, and while they are so amazing and bright, that's the only opinion that a lot of people get. So we need to know that there are leaders in art club, key club, gaming club, or it's academic. Today, we started at my school, Pikesville, um, with their... Easy, easy start. Uh, at their Young Engineers Club, it was led by my friend Lauren Lawson, who actually won the Shark Tank held last week with her partners, Morgan Hoffman and Eddie Fine. Um, I hope that my show inspires students to get active with clubs offered at their schools, or if they see a club on On The Move that they really love that isn't at their school, they can create one. Clubs are vital because that's where many students find their voice. And I hope that On The Move helps one student find theirs. Thank you. On the Move with Josie will soon be syndicated, so <laughs> keep your eyes out. Uh, next on our agenda is item J, that is uh, third reading of policies, and I invite Mr. Virch to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, the Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's proposed amendments to the following board policies. 3130, non-instructional services, products and services for purchase. Policy 3520, non-instructional services, maintenance. Policy 3532, non-instructional services, restitution for vandalism. Policy 5410, students, services to students, school counseling services. Um, policy 7250, new construction, designing school, uh, designing school building design, and the proposed deletion of the following policy. 3510, non-instructional services, physical plan services, operations. Do I have a uh, motion uh, to approve the policies as presented by Mr. Birch? <laughs> How about if you're going to do all those, we just do them one at a time? Sure. Uh, okay. Do I have a motion to uh, approve uh, the suggested changes to policy 3130 uh, products and services for purchase? All right. Do I need a second? No need for a second. No? Okay. All right. Discussion. Yes, thank you. On uh, 3130, I was concerned about the language being added in Section 2A, which allows the establishment of contracts with businesses and nonprofits um, being offered for sale to students. Um, now, I think that the policy allowed that before, but I wanted to understand what the difference was here, because it seems that instead of these sales being about school spirit, the new language makes it more about businesses competing for and establishing relationships with BCPS to win contracts. Um, so I'm seeing the difference as 
it's moving from um, school officials, and I assume that's, I'm not sure if that's on the school level or uh, system level, to the superintendent. So if I could get a little clarification on what those changes are. Uh, first, um, it is not as though uh, items are not being purchased currently by students in our schools. That's the first thing. Um, secondly, the uh, policy merely uh, documents that the superintendent establishes procedures. As one knows, um, in fact, ours is a two-step process. First, there is a policy, and then there, are the, there is the implementing rule, and the implementing rule then goes in, will then go into additional details, but that has to follow the standards section. And as I'm sure the member has reviewed the policy analysis, it clearly identifies that this clarifies the purpose of the policy and it includes standards uh, for the negotiation and execution of contracts with businesses. So it is not, these negotiations are not being conducted by board members. In fact, one will note this new, uh, will, will note this, the, the retention of such important language as the highest standards of ethical behavior. So it isn't as though this is now a shift to privatize our schools and allow folks to come and, and hawk their wares. There's a means by which to do this. Remember, the market exists because the school spirit exists. It's not the other way around, unless you know the school where that is the case. And if the member does, please share it, because this is the time at Third Reader when we should know these facts. Well, thank okay. you for the tutelage, but I didn't quite get my question answered. I'm trying to understand. You, you said it's about the method. No, procedures is the word that's in the policy, and I direct the member's attention to Roman numeral two, to standards. Under A, the superintendent shall establish procedures for negotiating and executing my agreements. My question is to understand what the change means in terms of, you know, practical, in practical terms. Or, or is the change just to modernize language and not make any change and at all? And that might be the case. Well, so in I'm fact, there is, as you note in here as well, to conform to our editing <coughs> conventions. That's also in the member's policy analysis. Okay, okay. so the, the change I'm seeing is that it's moving from being defined I mean, I'd have to go, I just made notes here, so I'm not looking at the actual policy. Here, would you like me it's to pass moving, a copy over? <coughs> no. It's moving from school officials to the superintendent is the, the part that I wanted to understand. And we've answered that quite directly in my first response. Okay, it is not maybe the maybe central office. Well, I beg your pardon for a moment. You've asked it. the question. If you prefer it not to be answered, we can also go along with that. I, I, you know, if someone else wants to chime in, that would be great, too. Well, where I would like to then repeat to you is that it is not the local school official that is establishing procedures. It is the superintendent that establishes the procedures. And that's what's delineated, and that's why we, we took that brief review of our two-step process. And that was in the first response to the member's question. Okay. Does anyone else have want to add in? Ms. Ms. Causey. Causey, please. It's always a part of the process. Oh, you need to put on your mic. Now you can say it again. <laughs> oh, it's always a part of the process to have uh, school officials in terms of the procedurally how things are implemented. Absolutely. Okay. okay, so that brings me to the core of my question because that is the language that's being deleted from the policy where B, to, I mean, uh, to B, where it says the board authorizes the superintendent to designate those school officials who may enter into relationships. And that is being replaced with 
the superintendent shall establish procedures. So that's what I wanted to understand. Why, if you're confirming that that's the process, why is that language being deleted? I just, I don't think I quite understand your question in terms of the, it is up, it's incumbent upon, of course, uh, when it says the superintendent will establish procedures, we do that in collaboration with internal offices and school staff to make sure that those procedures are actually those that are realistic for schools. So again, we do get input from others in, order, in terms of those procedures, but um, I, I guess I'm not understanding um, your, the, the heart of your question. Yeah, I just didn't understand why that language is being deleted. She wants, she, I'll ask it another way. She wants to know why uh, you, there is a deletion of you being able to designate school officials who may do so. The, uh, the only official at a school who can enter into a, a contract is the principal. And we've uh, tried to uh, codify most of the situations in which a principal would uh, enter into an agreement and set for, and, and also standardize the form of the contract because uh, there were, uh, all types of agreements being executed by principals for a variety of services, and uh, this, these changes are designed to constrict. So let me let that. me try to help again, Mr. Yeah. Saris. The old policy said the superintendent could designate persons to enter into contracts. This one allows the superintendent to establish procedures that are to be followed by those persons. Correct. So there's consistency. Right, okay. and uh, also the law office is trying to institute a standard form contract so that we can have more uniform uh, practices across the system and avoid conflicts okay. that we've had in one place from occurring someplace else and have everybody working on good. one So Mrs. Platform. Miller, does that answer your questions? Yes, thank you. Very good. Any more questions on policy 3130? All in favor, please raise your hand. All righty. Next is 3510, deletion of 3510, non-instructional services, physical plant services operations. Is there a motion uh, to move that? All right, discussion. All in favor, please raise your hand. That carries. Next is 3520, non-instructional services, uh, physical plant services. Um, is there a motion to accept the re recommended changes to policy 3520? So moved. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. That motion carries. Next, number four is changes to policy 3532, non-instructional services, physical plant services, restitution for vandalism. Is there a motion to accept those changes? Move to accept those changes. All right, any discussion? Mrs. Miller. Yes, I had a question on um, the change to Section 1A, um, where before uh, it says the board will initiate the prosecution and seek restitution from any individual who vandalizes board property, um, but, but that's being taken out and it's only being defined as any student. Am I reading this correctly? It, it, then it only talks about students who vandalize. Two things. The first is if someone who is not a student vandalizes um, property, that is a crime, and the prosecution, the, the prosecution of that person can occur via a police report. Our scope, our focus, our interest here are our students. And it reads as it reads. Well, and I'm trying to understand why it reads like it reads, because while we can seek prosecution, it's specifically said that the board will initiate prosecution 
and that's being deleted. So I wanted to understand why that's being deleted. And right now, we collect over a thousand bucks a year from folks <laughs> via this means. Uh, we have the boards, or rather we have the systems council behind us with regard to the specific change. Would anyone like to comment on why that change is well, being made? Well, I've just directed the question I, I, to you. I, I think as, as I remember the discussion as we're referring to the student and, and the responsibility of students since they're a minor becomes their parents for their family. And, and I don't think that the old rule uh, delineated that a student uh, can be prosecuted or can be held responsible for. So th that, that just says a student who vandalizes will be responsible for the cost of repair and or replacement. Right, and it's eliminating the part that says that the board will prosecute anyone who vandalizes. So as, as a rule of thumb, anybody mm -hmm. who's not a student who uh, destroys property subject to a police report uh, is charged with vandalism. And we have the... Let's, uh, let's ask Ms. Yeah, Howie. Yeah. An Practice in applying this particular policy has been to apply it to students. In my experience, we have <coughs> not applied it to individuals. Therefore, when the change was recommended by staff, the change was made to conform to the current practice of the school system. So we just don't want to have anything in policy regarding a requirement to prosecute. Let's, let's clarify it this way. Uh, the Board of Education has authority to control student behavior. The state of Maryland has authority to, to uh, discipline, prosecute those uh, who may not be students who damage our property. Okay, thank you. All right, all in favor of the suggested changes to 3532, please raise your hand. That one passes. Next is consideration of changes to policy 5410, students, services to students, school counseling services. Is there a motion to accept that? So moved. All right, there's a motion. Any discussion? Mrs. Miller. Yes. Um, uh, in the policy statement, at the very end, the language that's being taken out, uh, it says, enable students to reach their <laughs> maximum potential as responsible lifelong learners and productive citizens. And it's being replaced with globally competitive and prepared for the chosen college and or career path. And to me, this statement at the end of that paragraph really defines what the purpose of education is. And it's being changed in this policy. And I really think that the original language was a much more valuable statement of the purpose of education. And I would urge uh, the board to consider retaining the original language. <coughs> Other comments, Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think in light of you know, what we have uh, been focusing uh, on as our Microphone. Thank you. I'm a lifelong learner, and apparently <laughs> I'm a slow learner as it comes to reading, push to talk. So I will be more mindful of that. Um, but keeping in mind our focus through our interim superintendent and our support of her, um, not initiative, but going back to the foundation of lifelong learners through literacy, and then our focus on school climate, which has to do with behavior. I think it would be appropriate, and I had in my notes, to add back that phrase because it does embody so much of what we are trying to do in our school system. We want each child to reach their maximum potential, to understand their story and help them to live and, and achieve their dream of that story. Um, also, lifelong learners through literacy, that's very important. And when we talk about being globally competitive, it is about being able to adapt because our state is adapting, our county is changing, our country is changing, we're being more interconnected, and being able to continue to learn and adapt is going to what help 
that will help our children succeed. And of course, it is important that they become productive citizens. So I would make a motion that we add that whole phrase right back on the end. All right. Um, so there's already a motion to um, <coughs> accept 5410. You want to amend that motion to do what? To Just add to add that in addition to what's already there? Yes. All righty. Second. It's all right, there's a motion and a second. Now discussion on that motion to amend. Mrs. Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Schaefer. Um, I guess to clarify the, um, sorry, um, the be globally competitive and prepared for their chosen college and career path, um, I think it's important to have that there. Um, guidance counselors are now doing this thing called a I think it's a six-year plan or seven-year plan, um, six-year. It was rolled out last year, so I did not get to participate in the full six years, um, which wasn't necessarily hurting or helping, but um, this six-year plan um, does help students become globally competitive and prepared for their chosen college and career because it goes from seventh grade to six years from then. <laughs> and, um, and that's the role of the guidance counselor, and you're supposed to have like a meeting to decide it every year. So that's that. Okay. So the motion, uh, Mr. Birch. To the extent we are in such a thoughtful mode, let's make sure that we can transition from the new language to any language that we would add back in. And it can easily be accomplished by just after the word path, deleting the comma, deleting strike that the period, and inserting as well as reach their maximum potential as responsible lifelong learners and productive citizens. If we don't delete the period, we have two periods okay. in there. So that's a friendly amendment. Is that accepted? All right, any further discussion on that issue? All in favor of the motion to amend, <laughs> please raise your hand. All right, now we have an amended motion. Any more discussion on 5410? All in favor of the amended 5410, please raise your hand. All right, that passes. And the last one is changes to policy 7250, new construction, designing, school building design. Is there a motion to accept that? So moved. Any discussion? Mrs. Miller. Um, I think I had emailed the PRC about this suggestion was to um, add language which would have the effect of encouraging the use or reuse of existing or standardized building plans as a measure to reduce costs and construction time. Um, unless I missed it, I didn't see anything that suggested that. Um, so I'd like to just get some input from the PRC on that and whether that was discussed? In fact, the video clearly shows it was discussed. First, there is another policy which actually addresses the overarching issue of cost effectiveness. And that's a policy that in itself will be coming up, perhaps depending on what the board does, as recently as uh, or as soon as next year. And that policy is 7310, uh, and it was actually um, uh, one of the staff that brought it to our attention that it specifically makes reference to cost effectiveness. Um, that was Ms. Clark who made that during the uh, meeting of the uh, policy review committee. Secondly, with regard to, say, reusing plans, um, staff, um, Mr. Dixit, in fact, indicated during the meeting that currently there are two prototypes for elementary schools. Uh, he reiterated uh, something similar to me uh, with regard to um, uh, the approach that's taken in all levels of the new school construction slash renovation process. Um, the term that he uses on the video minutes of the committee meeting is the culture of cost effectiveness. So in fact, to answer your question, was there discussion? Yes. Is that addressed? Cost effectiveness is addressed. It's addressed in another policy. Are we currently reusing plans? Are we making those available? Yes, there is use made of those. 
but it is stressed for all of us here that each set of plans must be adapted to a site. Remember, there are also changes which occur in materials. New materials are identified. Building codes can change. New expertise in, in, the, in, the, in construction techniques may occur. So that then there may, in fact, be plans that, yeah, they, uh, they were already drawn up. But, you know, there are other ways to do things that can, in fact, be better. And so much of what we do is subject to direct review at the state level. Um, for those reasons, the, board, uh, the PRC, uh, given that it's already addressed and this concept of cost effectiveness is already addressed and that reusing plans is another way to become cost effective, um, this was not approved at the time of the PRC meeting. It isn't as though we're encouraging people. It's already being done. All right, any further questions on 7250? Well, I'd like to just Mrs. respond Miller. to that then. I appreciate that explanation. And, and it seems that this is totally in line then um, to add that language because it's in the cost portion of another policy, but this is dealing with the design this policy does. So, it, and since it's something we, we're already doing, uh, it makes sense that then we would add in the language into the policy that discusses school building design and just have language that says that we encourage the use or reuse of existing or standardized building plans as a measure to reduce costs and construction time. And I would like to amend the motion to include that language in this policy. Where? Uh, I'll, I'm not going to specify where. I'll, I'll leave that Couldn't up to Couldn't be in the policy statement, because the policy statement is about uh, design, uh, is about effective delivery of instruction as the guiding principle. Well, I would let you know our team work on that and decide where the best place would be for that Mr. language. Mr. Chairman, if I would just Perfect. suggest, the, um, there's an excellent place to go if one would want to review, again, the minutes. There's specific mention made during the video uh, of the, uh, the minutes from the PRC meeting uh, that, that refers to the guiding principle, which is what this policy address. This policy addresses the guiding principle, and that guiding principle is that effective delivery of instruction. And uh, I see Mr. Uh, McDaniels nodding. He may specifically recall that, that, uh, that comment being made. And I recall it because I made it. So Mrs. Miller, I'd suggest that we can't just have an open-ended suggestion to add language somewhere. This is an opportunity for us to um, pass language modifying 7250. <laughs> so we either we accept it uh, as it's prepared or somebody recommends where it should be changed. Um, but we can't just have an amorphous, let's change it and... and I don't uh, know why we can't. As a matter of fact, I think that's the proper way to go rather than us just, you know, So I think you'd want us not to approve it now. Head. That would be the point? No. I mean, I think we could pr approve it with the stipulation that it, that language would be added. Okay. Is there, a sec is there a second to Mrs. Miller's motion? We have done that in the past. Is there a second to Mrs. Miller's motion? There... Uh, it's been seconded. Oh, now discussion. Could you restate your concern? Um, my concern, you mean the motion? The language of the motion. Um, to amend the motion to add language that states BCPS encourages the use or reuse of existing or standardized building plans as a measure to reduce costs and construction time. All right, there's a motion. Um, Mr. Stewart. So perhaps uh, Mr. Virch can speak to this um, a little bit, but with respect to uh, the policy that he referenced, which I think was 7250. Uh, no, 7310. Oh, I'm sorry, 7310, excuse Correct. me. Um, when the policy committee does uh, have the opportunity to review that policy, it's my understanding that at that time 
the committee will consider language that encourages the exploration of alternative building technologies. Is that right? Uh, well, in fact, there's always that opportunity during um, the policy review committee for members to voice uh, their, uh, their thoughts. And given that that specific policy is uh, actually headed new construction financing, determination of school design and construction costs, it would seem uh, that that would be an appropriate place for contemplation of that. I, I would share that perspective. And I'll also just add that it was relatively recently that the interagency um, committee released a 60-page report on the Monarch Global Academy School, for, for example, to try to explore and start the conversation about alternative building technologies. And so it's not just limited to uh, one or two different ideas, as Ms. Miller suggested, but it's really a larger conversation. And so I'm going to vote against the specific inclusion. All right, Mrs. Cosey. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, also, having been at the Policy Review Committee meeting where this was discussed, um, I do agree that in the um, coming review of Policy 7310, that that would be an appropriate place to put this. And I would just suggest, rather than adding a motion to this current uh, policy, that we would um, suggest to staff that they include language, um, because it is, when I was looking up these policies, it is in other mm -hmm. LEA's policies. A simple statement, board will use prototype designs whenever possible. So to consider that to be added to the review of the policy and also um, what Mr. Stewart was talking about in terms of new technologies for cost-effective business constr uh, building construction. Mr. Yulfeld, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, the, the suggestion is not even applicable to this policy. This policy just says that in the design of a new school to, or renovation, to provide a safe, clean, and well-equipped facility. That's all. It doesn't talk anything about construction. It just talks about that when we design something, whatever it is, that it has to be safe, clean, and a well-equipped facility. So, I mean, I, what, your, what your suggestion doesn't even apply to this policy. Okay, so there's a motion to amend offered by Mrs. Miller. I'm not sure that I can say it exactly, but it encouraged the uses of standard building plans, standardized building plans. All in favor of that motion to amend, please raise your hand. All right, the motion fails for um, a lack of seven votes. Now, we're back to the original motion. Any further discussion? All in favor of 7250 as presented by Mr. Virch from the PRC, please raise your hand. That motion carries. Thank you all very much. Mr. Next up. Mr. Chair, Mrs. before Cosby. we move from policies, I would just like to um, make a recommendation that we, when we bring forward policy 7310, which is coming up, but we also bring forward 7110 at the same time because those are interconnected. Um, and, and it would be more helpful to review connected policies at the same time, um, because then all of those concerns can be addressed. Mr. Birch. We certainly can. And I, I welcome my fellow hardworking policy review committee members' suggestion. The fact is um, the folks on the PRC, they are members who read a ton of information. They work very diligently. This is an excellent suggestion. We certainly can do both of those. Thank you. Very good. Uh, next Mr. on our Chair, could Mrs. I also Miller. add something? Um, I was reading. We have a, a notification of a change to Rule 5140, and I'd just like to suggest that the PRC consider that change um, because the definition of overcrowding um, is based in that rule on staffing allocations at a school instead of on um, enrollment versus their state rated capacity. So I'd like to ask the PRC to maybe consider that uh, at an upcoming meeting. Very good. Uh, next on our agenda is item K, uh, personnel matters, Dr. Mayo. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Gillis Vice Chairman. Good evening, good evening. Stewart, Superintendent White, Members of the board, I like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, deceased recognition of service, certificated appointments, and area education advisory appointment. 
Is there a motion to approve items K1 through K6? So moved. Is there a second? Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Next is agenda item L, uh, and I call on Ms. White to uh, raise administrative appointments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Gillis, members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Specialists from the Office of School Counseling, Supervisor, Placement of Office of Special Education, Compliance, Placement and Birth to Five. And do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit L1? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. I'd like to congratulate the following members on their appointments, and I would ask them to stand along with their family members so that they can be recognized. First, we have Jennifer Abbey, who will be the new specialist in the Office of School Counseling. <laughs> Jennifer, do you have anyone here with you this evening? I see her smiling in the back. Congratulations. Uh -huh. I'd also like to congratulate Linda Porcino, a supervisor and placement office of special education. <laughs> Congratulations, Linda. Do you have anyone here with you? There we go. Yes. Very supported. Uh, Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Uh, next on our agenda is item M. Uh, that's consideration of action taken in closed section, closed session. Mr. Nussbaum. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered two appeals regarding confidential employee matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. One was an oral argument where the board heard from uh, counsel for the parties. One was considered on the record because a uh, request was not timely made for oral arguments. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken in closed session in those matters which were. Uh, hearing examiner seven, uh, decision 17-45 was the oral argument, and hearing examiner decision 18-05 was the summary affirmance. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. That motion carries as well. Thank you, Mr. Any Nussbaum. orders on the table? Orders are on the table. Thank Very good. Yes. That is correct. And those will be reflected on the sign. There's a reflection <laughs> in the order. Uh, next item N, uh, contracts. And I ask Mr. Stewart to take. Thank you. So members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee met earlier this evening. Items N1 through 11 are being forwarded to the full board for your approval with a certain abstentions by Ms. Causey and Mr. Yulfelder as noted at the time. Do I have a motion to approve items N1 through N11? So moved. All right. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Those All right, so let's, can you list for the um, abstentions? I have Mr. Yulfelder for number 8, number 10, and then Ms. Causey for 9. Very good. We'll make certain that those are incorporated. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, it is now down to agenda item O, board member comments, and I invite uh, Mr. Hayden to begin. Very good. Mr. Virch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, been out to a number of schools, was at our Kenwood, was at Golden Ring Middle School. Um, just a lot going on in our system. A lot of good things are occurring every day. Uh, there are challenges in our schools, but the fact is in many of our schools, new narratives are being written by uh, really hardworking staff. We're really quite fortunate. I was really excited to see one of the schools where uh, a very positive uh, narrative is being written is in our own 6th district. It was our Red House run, and you saw Principal Whitney there. Um, I, I want to tell you about another school, which is in also in our 6th our district, and that is Glenmore Elementary School. And many of you may have heard about math nights, and you may have heard about reading nights. Well, they had an ESOL night. 
and that's where the kids that are in the you know in an ESOL class uh, they come and their parents kind of come the kids know each other but the parents haven't yet like met and interacted uh, there were uh, interpreters available uh, the ESOL staff gave a presentation for folks there was a lot of information to be exchanged there was information about uh, liter uh, literary literacy uh, resources that were available to folks uh, it was really one of those positive kind of things. I just happened to find out about it because the parent mobile was at our Glenmore Elementary School. And uh, while I'm talking to the driver on the bus, here come a couple of teachers into, into the school, and I holler over to them, and they tell me what's going on. So I went in there, and they had pizza. And I, you know, it's tough to stay away from pizza. Uh, but it was really a fun time. So if you uh, have an opportunity to go to an ESOL night at a school in your district, you should certainly do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Eaton. I'm good. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do just want to say, uh, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, that there is a Oh, you just have to push it. That the mic is on. Oh, I just wanted to say, um, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, that there, uh, I truly am grateful for so much, so much that I've learned by being on the board. Um, grateful for so many of the um, even more wonderful teachers, administrators, and staff people that I have met um, in this journey. I uh, really enjoyed meeting um, more folks at uh, American Education Week, and I was pleased to support the interim superintendent at her listening and learning tour at Dundalk High School. Uh, I was also pleased to attend the Southeast Area Advisory Council meeting with June Eaton. Um, and it was great to be at the uh, Special Education Central Advisory Council meeting to hear the pre-budget meeting and Mrs. White's responses and conversation with this very, very important advocacy group. And I uh, also wanted to thank all of the very hardworking and caring special education staff. Not They're at these meetings and they're also taking care of the kids and working very hard um, with the parents and the staff. Um, I also want to say that when we bring the policies 7110 and policy 7310 forward related to determining uh, construction needs, new construction planning, and determination of school design and construction costs, um, that I'll be asking um, the chair of the PRC uh, and asking staff to bring to the Policy Review Committee an analysis of Anne Arundel County's 10-year strategic construction plan. What that includes is evaluating all the needs of the system and then prioritizing them according to predetermined objective criteria. While we do have uh, a plan for the uh, construction that's happening, it has shifted over time from year to year, and I think it's <coughs> more appropriate for us to understand as a board in the totality what the needs are and then more objectively uh, prioritize them and then to let the communities know where they are, where all of uh, their needs stand in terms of being met and being addressed, and, and even just in being known, in being acknowledged, um, that we do have a lot of needs, but we also have financial constraints that we have to work with, and so it's important that we do that comprehensive work uh, beforehand. Um, also, I attended the state board meeting today, um, and it's always very interesting to go to another board meeting. Um, and they also have an opportunity for public comment. And we heard from uh, stakeholders from all around the state, Prince George's County, Anne Arundel County, um, a college student came. And also there were several people there from uh, stakeholders from Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, and the Maryland State Board of Education is not only a governing board, but also a channel for assistance to local school districts. At the recent MABE conference that I attended with several of my board members and Chuck McDaniels, who's president of MABE currently, um, our state superintendent, Dr. Salmon, pointed to the many ways that the Maryland State Department of Education provides support and guidance. Therefore, I uh, requested that the Board of Education of Baltimore County and the school system would benefit from the assistance of the State Board and Dr. Salmon and the Maryland State Department of Education in developing a and implementing a more comprehensive uh, forensic audit. Uh, I know that the uh, super interim superintendent has put out an RFP for a procurement audit, but uh, I feel that it's not as comprehensive as it, as it needs to be. Um, so I feel a more comprehensive audit would ensure that all questions are answered any mistakes are rectified, and then it would allow our system to move forward with a clean slate and a fresh start for all of the leaders and all of our families and all of our students. So I hope to be discussing that with uh, our interim superintendent and the board 
um, in the upcoming weeks. Um, I just want to also say, because I don't think we'll have another time to comment, that we did have a holiday. We have another holiday season coming up, and I wish everyone a great holiday season. It's going to be a nice time for um, teachers and administrators and staff to take a break and refresh and energize. Um, and I just look forward to continuing to working uh, to do the best that we can for all of our students. So thank you very much. Mr. Yulefelder. Thank you, Mr. Yulefelder. Mr. Stewart. Thank you. <clears throat> So I just want to thank uh, my board members for your support. Uh, I look forward to serving as vice chair in the coming year alongside our reelected chair, Mr. Gillis. I know the best thing I can do in this new position is to keep it short, so I will. Uh, in the coming year, we have uh, a lot of issues that I know we'd like to tackle, and uh, that's before our terms are up next year. It includes making progress on the issues we did identified at our board retreat. And it's my intent and my priority to work with all of you to support this board and our system in the important work of planning for the future, of being proactive, and on executing on that vision, even as we continue to react and respond to the issues of the day. And yes, there are pitfalls ahead, but there's also great promise. And it's going to take hard work and collaboration and compromise. But I look forward to sharing that work with all of you and making sure that we cross the finish line of our terms, exhausted, having done all we can to better the system for the benefit of our kids. Thank you, Ms. Schaefer. <laughs> Mr. McDaniels. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. I do want to congratulate the newly elected board officers. And um, I do recognize that we were cautioned by Mr. McComb tonight about change. But um, I think a part of any good organization is continuous <coughs> improvement. And I think all of us as board members recognize that there are things that need to be approved, improved upon in the school system. Um, but we want to do that while recognizing the fortune that we have with some very talented professionals uh, serving as principals, teachers, and staff. And we hope as a board that we will move forward uh, in good collaboration with those professionals that we work with. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, I've been systematically um, visiting our um, most needy facilities as well as our um, finest facilities in the county and I've enjoyed that very much and will continue. Um, I also wanted to congratulate our uh, newly appointed vice chair and our again appointed chairman. Um, the, po the position of chairman requires a lot of time and commitment and I thank each of our previous chairmen for their service to the board. I voted for Kathleen Causey uh, because she has shown the commitment in her two and a half years on the board, setting aside work commitments to make time for board service. She's the hardest working board member, in my opinion, and has educated herself on each and every issue that came before her. And she takes proactive steps for the benefit of the school system. We've had a lot of repetition in recent years with the same leadership recycled over and over, whether it be board leadership or board committee leadership. The same ideas and views, the same governance style, and the same mistakes repeated without correction. The circumstances in which we find our school system right now did not happen overnight, nor without warning, nor without the board's approval. <coughs> At every step of the way, the board could have changed the trajectory, but failed to do so. We're now entering a period of transition that this board has never encountered before, as we select a permanent superintendent in July and move to a hybrid model for the board in December. It's time to set aside the status quo for new ideas, a fresh start, diverse opinions, and sound governance that can restore the public's faith in our leadership and our school system. Although we've not had a real change in leadership, I believe individuals can learn and grow in their positions. I'm hoping for improved processes that reflect better governance processes. And I encourage stakeholders to engage with our leadership to encourage these much needed improvements. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to first thank everyone who took the time to email the board to share feedback on our current leadership. It's very heartening to know that we have so many engaged members of our community who care about the future of Baltimore County Public Schools. And I would encourage everyone to continue to stay in touch with us through your emails and testimony. We are listening. 
The board election afforded us an opportunity to be reminded of the many wonderful talents our members offer and bring to our positions. I am thankful for each of my fellow board members and appreciate your dedication and service. Congratulations to Mr. Gillis and Mr. Stort, and thank you both for your commitment to lead our board. I look forward to continuing to work with both of you to further our mission to serve in the best interest of students. Thank you. Mr. Young, last but not least. Thank you. I'm going to attempt to be short, um, given the late hour. Well, actually, I will be. I'll re remember this day for the next couple of hours as one that Mr. Hayden chose not to say anything. Uh, but no, um, my fellow board members, <laughs> I want to thank I'll all. Si I'll send you a little note on that. <laughs> the, you're, you know, that hey, you're trying to beat me for the silent one. Um, but to my fellow board members, thank you for your service and um, have a good evening. All right. Uh, a couple of announcements. So the board has a public hearing tomorrow at. Um, uh, 6.30 p.m. at Lansdowne High School concerning the proposed boundary for Lansdowne Elementary School. Uh, our next board meeting is December 19. We're adjourned.